Hello there. Welcome back to Star Wars in a Galaxy, watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. Today is our 51st mainline episode, and we are going to be continuing our watch through of the Clone Wars. We are Today we're taking a look at Overlords, Altar of Mortis, and Ghosts of Mortis. Eli, these are three of your uh, favorite episodes, correct? These are probably my three favorite episodes of this season. Um, they're, they're up there for me just generally in the series. There are two specific sequences in here that are among my favorite in the entire Clone Wars mo uh, like series in general. Um, yeah, I know you're a little less um, positive on them. I know they're not as much your thing. They're my I could do this stuff all day, honestly. Like I could do the Force mysticism stuff all day. Um, actually, I will say this: I'm glad that we only have one of these because it makes this one this feel this one feel way more consequential. Um, this the, it, yeah. it, it makes this one feel more important. Um, yeah, I'm Eli. I'm Jacob. Uh, let's just get into this, why don't we? Yeah, um, okay. In Overlords, uh, um, the Jedi detected ancient 2,000-year-old Jedi distress code. So a Republic cruiser, along with a shuttle carrying Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka, go to the coordinates. However, Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka's shuttle is pulled into a strange floating monolith, and they are... Uh, they're transported to the magical force world of Mortis, where they meet the father, the son, and the daughter. Yeah, the, each of uh, our Jedi protagonists has a vision. Um, Anakin realizes, or I guess the father tells Anakin that the the son and the daughter are fighting, but he brought, um, but that he brought Anakin there to test if he was the chosen one, and Anakin passes the test and. This, the father says, okay, you're the chosen one. You can and leave. he's able to bend. Pardon? You, and you can leave. That's sorry. Yeah, and you can leave. But as it turns out, there are there are two more episodes on Mardis. So, uh, yeah. So he doesn't they exactly do not leave, leave successfully. Uh, spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's get to our fortune cookie, which is balance is found in the one who faces his guilt. Balance is found in the one who faces his guilt. Yeah, this is a pretty... This is a pretty cool fortune cookie. Um, to me, you know, I think it. Uh, obviously, it it's referring most of all to Anakin, since he is pretty much the reason that they're there. Um, and a lot of these episodes are Anakin struggling to uh, to to find balance. Um, and when he talks to Shmi or his vision of Shmi, which was being manipulated by the sun. This really shows that his um, his struggle and his guilt. You know, he feels very guilty about about the the massacre that he committed in response. Um, so I I kind of took it to be about Anakin. What did you think of it? So one of the things this arc had me majorly assess, and I actually changed my opinion about this because of this time watching this arc, is what balance in the Force actually means. I have had three explanations for what balance in the force is me means has meant in the general um, my general journey in Star Wars. At first, I thought balance meant equal light, equal darkness. And so, as a result of this, by the way, balance in the force also affected my interpretation of the prophecy, which is heavily um, discussed in these three episodes. So, if balance in the Force is equal light and equal dark, then the prophecy by is fulfilled by Anakin when he and Palpatine kill all of the Jedi because it's two Jedi and two Sith. Yeah, then, I mean... Then, later on, I shifted to think it meant all light because George Lucas has reportedly viewed the dark side as a corruption in the Force. So, Anakin then restores the prophecy when he kills Palpatine, no Sith, all Jedi, all light. Now, through reviewing this arc and through referencing a certain movie, Slap's poster of Last Jedi, I'm led to believe that the Force is a yin and yang, a powerful light and a powerful darkness, and that balance comes between from recognizing that both 
exist inside everyone and controlling your good instincts inside you so that you are not consumed by darkness. That recognizing that darkness has to exist because it ex exists in everyone. But that you have to... And that it's not bad to feel dark side feelings because everybody feels them. But that the light side will ultimately make you a better person and choosing that path, I guess. Um, and that's what we see Anakin fail to do, really. Um, because he, in this arc and in Star Wars in general, often succumbs to his darker impulses. Um, yeah, that's just my take, anyway. Yeah, um, balance um, can mean different things to different people in oh, absolutely. such that d characters, certain characters, especially these kind of uh, more um, almost biblical type of uh, force characters like Anakin and the son, their approaches to balance and their different definitions of what balance means and what balance should be tells us more about them rather than about the force or about balance itself. Absolutely. Like, you know, um, the yeah. Bendu, for example, he thinks that balance is just like his whole thing is, oh, I'm a rock in the river. I don't take sides. Balance is not taking sides and letting the universe just ebb and flow and take its course. You know, someone like Anakin in, in, in his earlier days or Luke might say, bringing balance to the force, it means wiping out the dark side because it's a, it's a corruption of the the natural flow of the force and then there's someone like the sun who maybe doesn't think that it needs to be equal light or equal dark but kind of doesn't think that the dark side is necessarily wrong or it's not he thinks that the dark side is not necessarily wrong or unnatural the beauty of this arc in my opinion like one of the many beauties of this arc and it comes at the very end of the arc so i won't exactly tell you what plot point causes me to think about this until the very end but this arc makes it very clear that you can believe whatever you want from this arc, and you can not believe whatever you want from this arc. That your interpretation is the most important part of this arc. Um, I'll tell you what that is at the end, because it's the very it's one of the very last thing that's hap things that happens in the arc. Um, but I, I firmly believe that this is, you know, um, Alden Diaz has something he says about uh, Star Wars, which is, Star Wars is like the dark side cave. What's in there? Only what you take with you. You, your own experiences with Star Wars, your own experiences in your life influence this arc, specific because this arc is very emblematic, in my opinion, of what Star Wars is, but everything yeah. needs Star Wars. Um, so, your interpretation, and, you know, we're giving ours, but ours aren't the right answers. Ours are just our answers. So, yeah, they, they get to this distress signal, um, and then they go on to the... I'm very tempted, and many people are very tempted, to call Mortis a planet. But I don't really think that it is. I've called it, like, a celestial plane. Defining what really happens in this arc is harder than you think, because they're such abstract concepts that you don't really know where to start with this kind of stuff. Um, that's always my trouble, is, you know, I call the the Mortis a plane, I call the ones celestial beings, you know. Um, yeah, I think that Mortis, it's alive. I mean, obviously, yeah, it's alive. They kind of allude to that. So I think you're right, it's not a planet. But I don't, I don't think we're necessarily meant to have an answer for what it is. Absolutely, we're not. This I don't, I don't, whole I don't arc is so mysterious. Yeah, I think the beauty, some of the beauty of this arc is, you know, this arc has very few, in my opinion, logistical problems. And that's not me praising this arc. That's me saying that, you know, this arc is has very, it doesn't have a lot of interactions between societies or technology. It opens itself up to really those metaphorical and thematic ideas. 
they land on Mortis, and they're very, very confused. They are one of the things I actually like about this arc first is how much we don't know about this. Palpatine isn't pulling the strings here, so we know very little going in. Like, realistically. I mean, not us, because we've seen this before, but, like, you know, um, watching this for the first time, you know very little. Um, and so they meet the daughter first. So one of the first things when asked who the heck she is, the daughter tells Anakin and Ahsoka and Obi-Wan, we are the ones who guard the power. We are the middle, the beginning, and the end. Yes. It's interesting to me that they talk about them being the ones that guard the power. Because over and over and over again, people creating Star Wars, you know, your Dave Filoni's and your Ryan Johnson's and your George Lucas's and all those people have described the Force as much more than a power. Um, it's interesting to me that she straight up says power because, I don't know, this, this, epi this, this arc feels very, you know, for all the talk that the Force is not a power, this is the most like a power that the Force has ever seen, seemed for me. And I still know that it's not. It's just like, I think I think a, part, a major part of this arc is Dave Filoni recognizing um, that the Force used by normal people has limitations and it's all about how open you are to it and all of that kind of stuff. And then just decides for an arc, but what if it isn't? But what if there are people who there are no limits for? Um, and decides to play with that for three episodes. Um, yeah. Which is, it, yeah. Again, I'm going to say this a lot in this episode. I love a lot of these interesting ideas. They're, they're just interesting things to consider. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of things to consider in this episode. Um, yeah. Unfortunate, I feel, unfortunately, I feel a little bit averse to a lot of it just because I don't really like the idea of force gods, but I'm going to, I'm going to I would give it all the benefit of the doubt for now because I, I definitely give it all the benefit of the doubt. I, I would also challenge your idea. And this is not to say, like, again, you're stupid for thinking this, because I, until very recently, thought this. I challenge your idea of Force Gods. I don't think they're Force Gods, because to, to, to say they're Gods means that they are entities that have the power of the Force, when, in my opinion at least, and again, you can disagree with this, but in my opinion, they're not entities with the power of the Force. They are the Force. They are yeah. the okay. the personifications of the light and the dark and the balance. Um, yeah. Um, going on, I want to talk about something uh, that people might not have realized. This episode is the first appearance in Star Wars The Clone Wars of one of the most influential voice actors in Star Wars history. And that is Mr. Sam Witwer um as the son and himself uh he will later return as the reborn darth maul he will also play palpatine in um uh season two of star wars rebels um indeed he also has voice roles in every one of the sequel trilogy movies as background roles of course um sam witwer as the son is so interesting to me because, you know, this is not Sam Witwer's first Star Wars role. His Witwer's first Star Wars role was Galen Merrick. Um, this was post Galen Merrick. And the sun is so, like, Galen was so rooted in the dark side until he wasn't. But the sun is so incredibly rooted in the dark side. And I think, I gotta say, Witwer and Adrian Wilkin Wilkinson, who plays the daughter, also, in addition to that, Lloyd Cher as the father, I think all do incredible jobs here because the the ones could seem cartoony. You know what I mean? 
they could seem, and they do seem to some people, I know, they see, they seem to you, Jacob, a little bit, I mean, again, I don't think you're wrong about this, but, like, they could seem way more cartoony than they are. If any one of them didn't take this thing seriously, it would have devalued the arc. But all three of them did take this seriously, and, you know... The lines, if you if you remove the voice acting and if you remove yourself from the universe, I'm sure, like most Star Wars lines, but especially these because they're about the cosmic balance of the universe, probably sound dumb as heck. But they make them all sound so believable. Here's here's a question for you. I, I say there's no logistical questions, but then I have a logistical question. The entire arc is centered around if Anakin is the chosen one. How do the more how do the ones not know? They exist out of outside of space and time, which seems like they know the future and the past. Yeah, as evidenced by uh, the sun showing Anakin up his future um, in Ghosts of Mortis. With all of that knowledge, how come they don't know if Anakin's the chosen one? that's a good question you know i i think um my only main thought is that maybe the power of the chosen one is a level um is a level of their own i mean we know that is because of what anakin does in these three episodes but maybe they have to witness the chosen one for themselves they can't just know that i don't know that's the one thing i have with this arc is how do they how do they not know you you do bring up a good point but i would i would say that maybe um they aren't as omnipotent as i or we thought they were and it, it, it it is very mysterious and maybe a force god isn't quite the right way to describe them so it's it's hard to say i would i think i'll i'll put this in code because um i'm gonna because again it's one of the final plot points of the final episode and i don't want to spoil it right away but it's one of the um it's one of a it's a contributing factor to what i'm going to call dilemma x and I'll reveal, reveal what Dilemma X is at the end of the episode. Um, mm. But it's a contributing argument to Dilemma X. Anyway, let's get to the visions in the cave. I mean, the, the visions that Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka have. Because I thought all three of these were so incredibly enlightening. Um, first of all, we got Liam Neeson back! Liam Neeson, twice! Once in uh, Overlords and once in Ghost of Mortis. As That's so cool. I didn't realize this was actually Liam. Of Qui Gon Jinn. One of the things I love is that Qui Gon is the first person who explains the true nature of the Force to both Anakin and Obi Wan, and that Qui Gon is the first person, release order and chronologically so far, that has mentioned the prophecy. Really? Y nobody mentioned the 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 prophecies first. And I mean. Unless we hear something about it in the High Republic, then the chronological. Oh, thing oh, I thought you out. meant in. Oh, I thought you meant in this. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes no, sense. No, in in Star Wars, just general history, who mentions the prophecy? Yeah, and I think um, I think we get the sense that Qui Gon is obviously he's a renegade and he's a bit of not necessarily an outcast, but he he is um. He's a maverick. Maybe he's seen as a little bit of a a loose cannon or a live wire for this. Um, he's a fanatic. He's seen yeah, as a maybe, fanatic. I don't know if no, I don't know if a fanatic is is necessarily the right word, but I definitely think that among the Jedi, he's clearly his views are seen as maybe not necessarily idealistic, but yeah, they're no. not. Let's just say they're not what the Jedi as, as a whole, and they're There's, not what the Jedi Council is endorsing. They're scorned. Qui Gon dedicates himself very much to the will of the force and the jedi of the prequel era don't really do that which is kind of part of their problem i just looked at my notes and i re realized i kind of solved my own logistical problem without realizing it the whole um 
uh, the whole how do they how do they not know? My theory is that they do know, and this is not this arc is not for them to prove if Anakin is the chosen one. This arc is for Anakin to prove to himself that he's the chosen one. That may look that may be, but for that to be the case, what would Anakin? What what reason could Anakin possibly have to trust the father? I I see absolutely no reason why after what happened with the vision with Shmi, with with everything the way that the father was behaving, I just don't see the vision was. I just don't see it. The vision of Shmi was established not to be the father's doing. The vision of Shmi was it was the son's doing. But in either case. How would Anakin, first of all, how would Anakin know? And second of all, it, it seems as though Anakin, at least in my mind, he wouldn't really care. He would just, he would just be like, oh, this place is, this place is giving me the willies. I'm not on board with this. I don't see how the father would be doing the test for anyone but himself. Maybe, maybe can you clarify? Because maybe, maybe I don't quite understand. So my idea is that, that the father, the son, and the daughter do know, or at least believe, again, they, uh, Qui-Gon says, they, like me, believe him to be the chosen one. At, at the very least, they believe he's the chosen one. I think they know, but that's just my opinion, that the the whole Mortis scheme was the father's idea to relay to Anakin that he was the chosen one, and I just realized evidence I have for that later on in this episode. Why would he want to do that? I have a motive. And the motive is because the father, at the end of uh, the episode, wants Anakin to take his place on Mortis. Yes. He wants him to be the chosen one to be the balance. And Anakin rejects him. We'll get to that moment at the end of the episode, uh, at the end of the, uh, our coverage of this episode, as, as to why, in my opinion, it's what, it's so consequential. You want to get to Shmi? Yeah, that part was that, that was intense. I didn't remember that part, so man. I was yeah. And and Anakin, it, it really, August returns. Yeah, it's heartbreaking that he can't even really bring himself to say that she's dead. You know, like it, it really, he really had to. He had to force it out of himself. To, to, to get that word out. So that alone just, yeah. that was that was sad. That was really sad. One of the things that the son does as Shmi, which I think is clever, um, is he preys upon Anakin's desires to be more than a normal Jedi. Palpatine tells him in Revenge of the Sith, ever since I've known you, you've sought the life beyond that of a normal Jedi. Um, yeah, and the son recognizes that in Anakin. Yeah, I think that Anakin loves. If we're gonna have another inside, if we're gonna have an inside the mind of Anakin moment, Anakin uh, yes. loves feeling special, not because of any egotistical trait of his, but simply because of his his upbringing and his experiences, feeling lost and forgotten on on Tatooine and being and taken he away owned. from. He was a yeah. slave. And he was taken away from his mother, who, who was he was the apple of Shmi's eye, and Shmi made him feel special. Was a very very caring mother, and they had an incredibly close relationship. And then he goes to the Jedi, and he's severely lacking that. You know, all of a sudden and the Jedi are like, you know, we're these interdimensional, not interdimensional, but you know, we're kind of these monks. We want to transcend. We want to transcend these um, this earthly realm in terms of emotion. Um, we want to we want to cut ourselves off from attachments. And Anakin, um, he he obviously needs a bit more nurturing um, after his experience as a slave and being taken away from his mom. But the Jedi don't really give him that all that much. Qui-Gon so does, any, but he's killed off. Yeah, almost. Yeah, immediately. exactly, exactly. So he re- so Anakin really responds to people affirming his individuality 
because I think the Jedi are well-intentioned, um, but their mistake is that they never affirm, yeah, they, they never affirm his individuality. They never really say like, Anakin, you are special. You are, um, you are worthy and you are worth taking care of and nurturing, not just because you're the chosen one, but because you are you and you're a person. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. Um, so he really, really responds to anyone who like tells him he's special. And I think that that gets manipulated, obviously, by Palpatine, because in Palpatine, all he ever says is, Anakin, you're special. You're not like those other Jedi, Anakin. You're great. You're the most gifted Jedi I've ever met, Anakin. Yeah. Yeah. And Anakin really responds to that because he doesn't just want to be the chosen one. But the Jedi, by trying to kind of banish compassion and and get him ready for the life of a, a Jedi and this monk, this monk uh, cut off um, existence, you know, they, they end up kind of traumatizing him more by not really giving him nurturing and individuality. But I think that as we see in terms of its effect on Anakin and its effect on Anakin's ego and, and his um, selfishness, this um the kind of the platitudes that anakin gets you know you're the most powerful jedi you're you're this you're that you're gonna be the greatest that that's that's a poor substitute for what he really needs but it's the only thing that he can get and so he yeah. he loves it um subconsciously absolutely. absolutely um one of the other things from this and i'm gonna go off a little bit right now because this is my favorite concept i think introduced in this arc actually so anakin tells his anakin tells the son who's pretending to be his mother i have a wife you've met her i i you know i love her i um and what does the son respond no she is a poisoner and this comes from not, something not just in, from the opinion, in the opinion of the son, but in the opinion of the father, too. And I'd suspect in the daughter just because I don't see why the son and father would have this and the daughter wouldn't. And it's about the nature of the Force. The Force, you know, seeing these, these, these avatars of the Force, I gotta rep think that they represent the Force to an extent. Yes. And the father wants Anakin, jumping to the end of the episode a little bit, the father wants Anakin to stay on Mortis. But Anakin doesn't want to. Qui-Gon talks about the will of the Force. Many, many Jedi just in general talk about the will of the Force. And the will of the Force itself, the Force, I think, kind of sees its will because so many beings, the Jedi, the Sith, follow it as ultimately important there's a lot of talk about destiny in this episode yeah definitely and anakin does not accept what is seen to be his destiny and what message is that sending the message that's been in star wars in my opinion all along which is that like predetermined destiny is a hoax that you make your own destiny what the father i think realizes by ghosts of mortis at least um the son never realizes this because he's the son and he's bogged down in his own desires and you know selfish wants because he's he is he's the son that's what he does but the father realizes that anakin you know it's 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 to the point where even the force fails to recognize that its own chosen one is still a person yes like you were talking about before that has their own autonomy and has their own and it's a it's actually it's strange for me to say this because it's it's it sounds really weird it's a shortcoming of the force it's a shortcoming of mm. the force as a celestial body represented through the father and the son and the daughter that they don't recognize that you know, yeah. I'm a person. I'm a person, and my name is Anakin. All throughout his life, people fail to realize what Anakin is. He's a 
person. Um, I went real, really deep there, but okay. Let's take it to this line, um, and then um, I'll toss to you because I, I, I love this line too. Um, another weird meaning of the Mortis arc. So, um, there, so the father is talking to Anakin about how he and his children are um, confined uh, to Mortis. Anakin yeah. asks, as a sanctuary? And the father responds, and a prison. This is the important part right here coming up. You cannot imagine what pain it is to have such love for your children and, and realize that they could tear the very fabric of our universe. This arc is not, I mean, yes, it's about balance because we've established all the balance things. This arc is not about the force. It's not about the dark side. It's not about the light side. It's not about, you know, these... I, I don't know this series super well, but like the almost like the the Dragon Ball Z esque powers we see here, um, you know, it's not about all of it. I that. love that person. It's about yeah. love. It's about. Because, yeah, ultimately that's what it is. Yeah, w one of the most striking things about this arc to me is that the sun is consumed by his own selfishness and dark side fueled emotions. But the daughter and the father both tell him that they love him in this arc. Both of them. That's that's deep right there. How can you tell somebody who's like the literal image of them, the the, the concept that they represent is everything that you would normally despise in a person that you love them anyway yeah that's that's the emotional crux of this arc one thing that i was that, that i that kind of stuck with me was the fact that when in their visions anakin and obi-wan both see another person from their past but ahsoka sees a vision of herself in the future now I was just, do you, do you have any idea of why that is or what it might mean because I'm certain that it it's not just it can't it can't just be a coincidence you know I was thinking about this the only thing I could come up with is Obi-Wan's being shown his past Ahsoka's being shown her future Anakin is inadvertently being shown both hmm That's because funny. Uh, he's talking with the Shmi, and um, and Anakin asks her, "What are you?" And Shmi says, "Your fate." And then I started to get thinking, "How does Shmi die?" In her son's arms. How does Anakin die? In his son's arms. Wow! Oh my gosh! Yeah! Oh. <laughs> Oh, that is just, that is heartbreaking and beautiful. Oh my gosh. Yep, it's great. Cow, I dude. love that. I love that so much. Um, yeah. Uh, so my only thought is that, that Anakin, because we see Obi-Wan, when, so whenever the son and the daughter have to do anything, the daughter always does it with Obi-Wan, and the son always does it with Ahsoka, and the father always does it with Anakin. Obi-Wan's being shown the past, because Obi-Wan represents the past. Um, you know, light side. Ahsoka's being shown the future, um, because she represents the future, and she's the dark side. Anakin, father, is being shown both past and inadvertently the future. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I know... The interesting thing is, deciphering um, Anakin's and Obi-Wan's visions were pretty easy for me. We know a substantial amount of Ahsoka's journey right now, but a deciphering Ahsoka's vision, t to me, was very difficult. Yeah, I think that um, the way I saw it, and this is a little bit vague, but I think in comparison to the other two, it feels to me as though this was trying to say 
Ahsoka is in the fate of the galaxy, in the fate of these this group of people. She is the wild card. In in the fact that you know she walks away from the Jedi, she escapes Order sixty six. She escapes Palpatine's clutches, and she helps create the rebellion that eventually brings Palpatine down. So I think part of what this is trying to say is that Obi Wan and Anakin, you know, they're playing their parts, but Ahsoka's part, as as she looks to the future, has yet to to really be determined, whereas. For, for Anakin and Obi-Wan, they are still looking towards the past in many ways. And in many ways, their destiny in the galaxy has already been shaped so much and, by and their I past in it, ways that it hasn't for Ahsoka. And I wonder if that's a story thing. I like your idea, and I wonder if that's a story thing too, because we know where Anakin and Obi-Wan end up. Like, just from, a, from an out-of-universe perspective, we know where they are. We don't know where Ahsoka is. Yeah. Um, that's that's why she's the wild card. It's interesting. Here's a weird mundane, seemingly mundane fact that really ties into me um, with this episode and this arc very well. Anakin's age when he turns to the dark side is 23 years old. Anakin's age when he turns back to the light side temporarily and then dies is 46. That means Anakin spends 23 years on the light side and 23 years on the dark side. Seemingly wow. normal. But I don't think I got to mention this. The event I see as the balance of the Force is not Anakin and Palpatine wiping out the Jedi, Vader and Palpatine wiping out the Jedi in Revenge of the Sith. It's not, An- it's not Anakin killing Palpatine in Return of the Jedi. It's Anakin dying. 23 mm. years on the light, 23 years on the dark, balance. So you think that as he dies, he achieves balance for the Force? In a weird sort of way, yes. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. And, yeah, it, it's an interesting, it's, it's, it's just something that I've been thinking about. Um, yeah, and... Um, yeah, let's get to this. Let's get to this final thing because this final thing is crazy, crazy, it's, it's, crazy, it's crazy, 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 crazy. So yeah. Anakin has to make a choice. The sun is holding Ahsoka, the future, and the daughter is holding Obi Wan, the past, and Anakin has to let go of one of them and choose the other. And Anakin does neither. He bends the son and daughter to his will making them kneel before him in an ultimate display worthy of the chosen one i think that that ties in very nicely to what you were saying about the balance in that the chosen one light and dark um the the chosen one is not necessarily chosen because they're going to eradicate the light side or the dark side but maybe because that they're going to, in their own life, achieve some balance between it. Um, yeah. That that was Anakin, my takeaway. I didn't. Anakin's I didn't have a, a ton for this, but Anakin's a very sloppy version, I guess, of that balance, but it, still balance, really. Yep. Uh, one of the best sequences, you know, I I was thinking about this. Um, again, it's what you take with you, but like this, the Mortis arc this time around made me appreciate the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. But it also made me appreciate the sequels in, a, in an odd sort of way. Um, both uh, the, the ones that really made me appreciate are Last Jedi um, for the stuff I'm about to explain and Rise of Skywalker for the dyad stuff and the essence transfer stuff that seems to tie in very well with that movie. Um, but in The Last Jedi, there's that sequence with Luke and Rey when they're training on Octo. And Remember the when they pan to like um seeing like life on the on the surface of the island and the below plants dying to then be reborn again. Um, yes, I life, remember. death, and between it all, balance. Mm-hmm. The light side needs to happen so the dark side can happen. Uh, they're 
the the light and dark work with each other as a yin and yang. Again and again, we've seen the, the light needing the dark to happen, and the dark needing the light to happen. Now the sun, as the dark side's, like, avatar, again, why he resists that so much is because the dark side inherently wants control. But they fail to recognize that the, the that dark's only happening so light can happen. And that's actually why the prequels, Jedi, a lot of ways, I think, lose their way in the prequel trilogy. is because they want control like the Sith do. They... Mm. They want that control over the light side, but they fail to recognize the same thing that the dark side fails to recognize, that the light side needs the dark side to happen. Hmm. Um, That's a very interesting perspective. I didn't, yeah, I didn't really consider that, but I, I think, yeah, yeah there, the, in that view of the force and what the yeah. force means, it definitely would make sense to say that you really can't have one without the yeah. other. Now, here's the thing. I'll just say this. Quite a few people would take this viewpoint and say, oh, Grey Jedi for life. George Lucas has said that Grey Jedis are kind of bullshit. And (laughs) I think that the Jedi, at their height, when they look inwards, even as the Warriors of Light can serve the balance of the Force. Because we've seen that the Jedi can help people. It's just yeah. when they start, like, bureaucratizing is what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, okay, so kind of, yeah, bur- like, the, like, like the Republic. Yeah, it's, yeah, okay. it's when, it, it's when, you know, yeah, I do believe that the Jedi can be, can be forces for good and so, still serve the balance in the galaxy. Of course, I think they were doing it wrong in the prequel trilogy, and that's the, the beauty of that trilogy. In The Altar of Mortis, uh, Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan are about to leave Mortis when the son kidnaps Ahsoka. Um, he takes her to his lair and pretends to be this very small creature um, who then poisons her to force her to turn to the dark side. Well, can I just say that's hilarious that he is this tiny goblin creature. That's There's something funny something. in there that I love too. Um, oh, yeah. Obi-Wan um goes to the daughter and anakin goes to the father to try and get ahsoka back um this all culminates between a heartbreaking battle between two heartbreaking battles one between the son and the daughter and the other one between anakin and later obi-wan and the corrupted ahsoka ending with um ahsoka giving the basically delete button of this arc the dagger of mortis to the sun, um, the the sun killing Ahsoka, the sun about to stab the father when the daughter intercepts the blade and dies from that from from the blade anyway. Um, uh, then the sun flees, and through a ritual, Anakin transfers the last life of the daughter um, to Ahsoka to bring her back to life. Um, and the father mourns the loss of his daughter. A lot happens in this episode, but we should get to the fortune cookie. He who surrenders hope surrenders life. And Jacob, this is a weird turn for Star Wars. It mentioning hope. Star Wars doesn't mention hope often. Yeah, no, this is really an untapped goldmine of a theme. I really, really never, no, never seen this play out before. I'm, I'm excited to see what they do with it. I'm, yeah, you know, uh, I can't even say that with a straight face. It's gonna um, be, it's gonna be different. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. Um, first of all, I gotta tell you something. Um, I don't agree with the son on many things, but the first thing he, one of the first things he says in this episode is, "How simple you make it, light and dark." As if there is one without the other, which, you know, kind of supports the powerful light, powerful darkness theory. But, um, yeah. anyway, the sun tries to convert Ahsoka to the dark side before poisoning her. Yes. Poisoning her seems to be a last resort. Oh, yeah, for sure. Which says a lot about Ahsoka as a character. Why? 
a question I ask myself is, why was the apprentice Ahsoka, but like the figure of the apprentice, the future? Why was she the one being held by the sun and represented by the dark side? And I realize it's often because mas apprentices betray their masters and not the other way around. I'm not saying it never happens the other way around, but often apprentices betray their master. But Ahsoka is an anomaly in that case. Ahsoka, in a lot of ways, is wiser than Anakin is. Yeah, in, in, and yeah, in quite a few ways. is more tethered to the light than her master is. And it says a lot that it takes poison from a literal avatar of the dark to convert her bad. Yeah, um, I, I think, um, yeah, yeah. definitely going for the future there in, in terms of why the sun chooses yeah. Ahsoka. There's, in, there's in a lot opinion. in Ghosts about controlling the future, yeah. Um, here's a fun connection I realized. This, this is gonna... So, the that little goblin creature that the sun turns into... Yes. ...frees Ahsoka from her chains... And, um, and she says, thank you. And then the goblin says to her, the chains are the easy part. It's what goes on in here that's hard. Now, this is interesting. You know why? Why? Let me read something to you, okay? Okay. This is from episode, uh, season four of the episode Brothers. Savage Press is talking to Darth Maul, the, like, the spider Maul, Okay. This is where you live. How long have you been here? Years and years and years. Through victory, my chains are broken. The chains. The chains are the easy part. It's what goes on in here that's hard. Yeah, it, it's, it's so a great... Um... The Witwer-voiced son says that line. And then a season later, the Witwer-voiced Maul says that line. Which is mind-blowing to me. Because um, I recognized it, because, believe it or not, Sam Witwer was on Star Wars Explained with Alex Damon, and he said, and I remember him saying the the chains are the easy part on Star Wars Explained. I'm like, and oh, I such heard a great that, line. I, I said that by the, I heard it said by the Goblin, I'm like, wait, didn't Maul say that? And I checked my, I checked back on the episode. Yep. He does. I thought the fights were pretty, uh, pretty, pretty well done. I... I like them. The, um, the son and daughter yeah. fight to me seemed very. All, all I'll say about it is they seem. It seemed very Dragon Ball Z esque. <laughs> yeah, um, I suppose it did. Uh, I also liked. Here's another Last Jedi parallel. Um, the daughter and son are closing in on each other with those like elemental force powers. Um, and then the father busts in and he goes stop, and then he pushes them both back. Which reminded me of this scene where Ray and Ky and Ray and Kylo were like the the touching hands thing, and then Luke bursts in and says, "Stop!" Oh uh, yeah, which I thought was a nice touch. Um, uh, but this fight between Anakin and Ahsoka is just heartbreaking. One of the things I enjoy about this fight is that because Ahsoka seems and Ahsoka and Anakin just as a master apprentice pairing seem like a really good pairing that don't have a lot of problems with each other. They've worked out a lot of those they've worked out a lot of those problems by now. So I'm like, what could they pull? Well what about the idea that Anakin by his you know, by you said before, as his raising as a slave, is so egocentric and he wants to he often wants to call attention to himself in battle. He's quite a daredevil. What if Ahsoka secretly feels that's holding her back? That's the concept explored in this episode. What if Aunt, what if Ahsoka feels that deep inside her? Because I don't think I don't think the son makes her say anything that isn't true already. I think she, he just amplifies it. I have like sixty different parallels in this episode. If you are to survive, you must forget your master. Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. Um. Or what about the son saying? Everything has transpired exactly as I had planned. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. A lot of a lot of mall and uh, a lot of Sidious in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so do you got the do you got stuff about that ritual at the end? The ritual, man. Um, 
it was it reminded me a lot of avatar the last airbender um that was one thing that i thought was cool about this these episodes was how they kind of tapped into the spiritual the mystical i should say side of the force and of star wars that we don't really get a ton of in the clone wars and um yeah i, I that's one other thing also that i like about rebels is it taps into that um and maybe that's they why Rebels out, also isn't for everyone. They go all out twice in the Clone Wars. They go all out in Mortis, and they go all out um, on Yoda's quest at the end of six. Yes. In season six. They, that's the only times they go all out. Um, I gotta say, one of the things that this, this scene really um, reaffirmed my love of is the dyad transfer at the end of Rise of Skywalker. Because you think about it, the, these two scenes aren't really that different. It involves, I mean, Anakin transfers the life through the daughter um, to Ahsoka, but I still see that as Anakin transferring the life to Ahsoka, even though even if it's not his own. Um, both transfer life to somebody else. Con- conveniently, both of them are through the light side, not the dark, of course, because the dark has been well established. You can't do that, basically, through the dark. And in each case... It sacrifices somebody. The daughter and Ben in Rise of Skywalker. Um, and it's interesting to me that they're, the sequences are so similar. Um, I know there's there have been behind the scenes um, details revealed that um, co-writer for Rise of Skywalker, Chris Terrio delved into the expanded Star Wars media beyond the movies a lot in preparation for The Rise of Skywalker, including watching episodes of The Clone Wars and Rebels, and I have to believe that this is one of the ones he watched. The parallels seem too obvious to ignore. In Ghosts of Mortis, um, the father tells Anakin and Ahsoka and Obi-Wan that they have to leave because the, if the sun gets their ship, then the sun will be able to, to head out into the galaxy. So, you know, there's some drama. They get back to their ship, and the sun this time turns Anakin to the dark side by showing him visions of, their, of his future. Um, so, and then Obi-Wan goes looking for the sun, or Obi-Wan goes looking for Anakin, despite the father's warnings not to. Anakin and Obi-Wan have a confrontation. We end up with the father killing himself in order to take away the son's power. Yeah. Um, something you might have missed in there is Anakin, dark side Anakin goes to the father who then erases his memory. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's um, what I was missing. Thank you. Yeah. The fortune cookie is he who seeks to control fate shall never find peace this seems like by the way so last week of course no two weeks ago we were doing those fortune cookies for the movies he who seeks to control fate shall never find peace sounds like one for revenge of the sith i wrote uh, down here um as i said previously on the episode destiny is a hoax you define <laughs> your own destiny if you want to control others destiny all you will find is pain um example of course anakin and revenge of the sith so I've already talked about how much I love Anakin bending the son and daughter to his will. There's one sequence in this arc from this episode that I love even more. That's my favorite sequence in this arc. And it all begins with one simple question asked by the son. What if I could show you the future? The question for the ages. Um, yeah. I think that's something that I know I've asked myself that on occasion. What if I could see the future? What would happen? And I think what happens with Anakin is kind of what would happen is it would mess you up. It would really mess you up because, you know, it it would, we obviously we, our existence within time as humans and in star Wars as sentience is, is completely linear. and has to be grounded at one, uh, what we think of as, as in what we think of as one point. And it kind of breaks Anakin. Um, it does to see like what the bad things that happen to him but i think that that just shows that like it's the bias from the brother because 
I mean, look, Anakin's life does definitely take a turn for the worse as Darth Vader, obviously. It, 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 it's, it's pretty terrible. But he's being shown all the bad things at once and none of the good things. Like, and he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't see how he's going to... Um... And that's why I think that it's not Anakin just turning to the dark side just because he sees what happens. It's because of the son and his manipulation. He doesn't see how he ends up getting to meet his son and, and he doesn't see that he ends up... Um, in, in the Legends novelization, at least, he doesn't see that he ends up getting to reconcile with um, with Obi-Wan in the Force or getting to see his son or getting to, to kind of redeem himself. But I do think it's, 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 it's quite a scene. But what, what do you make of it? Well, the, besides the thematic things, because I will explore a little bit, the visuals and the music of this part are just groundbreakingly good like holy crap first of all i just want to say see hearing matt lanter and james arnold taylor say lines for revenge of the sith is chilling hearing james arnold taylor's take on you are my brother anakin oh it's so good um seeing events from the movies in television is always in in the animation is always something i love um if I could, if only, if I could, if I was an animator, I, one of the first things I would do is I'd make a special edition version of this scene where Anakin, where Anakin sees a little bit more. He see, we'll, we'd see like a, the stamp of, a, of an at walker on Hoth. And then we'd also add the, the shot from Force Awakens where Luke puts down his hood. And then we'd also add the shot from Rise of Skywalker where Palpatine, um, sprays the lightning across the galaxy to, to tie the sequel trilogy in there um but that's just me fantasizing at this point it would be so cool though um <laughs> yeah, that'd be a little much though anakin tries to control the future anakin's uh, will become obsessed with controlling the future um one of the other one of my other favorite things um about this is of course we, we didn't mention the big climax to this which is anakin going we going the very famous no and then we see the smoke of vader's helmet behind him which is chilling is one of the most chilling images in the clone wars in my opinion the, it was the original helmet in the snow it was like before that happened it was the vader helmet in the mist um yeah, the helmet in the 100%. snow and the helmet in the mist <laughs> yep there's always they're all it's always the helmets they always get you one of my most interesting things about the outcome of this Notice how similar Sun in Sun controlled Anakin and Palpatine controlled Anakin are. You know, the Sun pitches himself as different from the Sith. You know, yes. we'll destroy the Sith, we'll destroy this Emperor. But the but then at the end of the day, not that this is like so crazy groundbreaker or anything. There's no evidence, to me at least, that he would be that different than a Palpatine. One final thing I have before that final confrontation is uh, the son goes to uh, his sister's tomb. He says, it's ironic, my sister. First of all, it's ironic. But anyway, yeah. it's ironic, my sister. You were the only one I truly loved. And then I literally wrote in my notes, wow, do I feel bad for the sun? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we're meant uh, to feel bad for the sun. Clearly, um, yeah. I mean, in the deleted, in the deleted scene where, um, where he's like, I've done what I've done all that you asked. Why, why do I still feel such pain? Um, when he's talking with Are Bane. Are you talking about the Bane and Rev? I was about to mention the Bane and Rev deleted scene. Yeah, I, I mean. Would have been. Okay, I thought that would have been great. Hot take. The Bane and Revan scene would have been such incredibly cool fan service, but I think would have detracted from the role of the arc. Yeah. Like the, so the, the fact the, that it's Revan is balanced out by the fact that it's Bane? No, I actually think both of them being there just negates the idea of the sun zone. Because the sun says various other times in the arc, and I, I, I think and I hope this is why it was removed too. The son says various other times in the arc that he's not a Sith and he doesn't, he, he, there's no, he's never been associated with the Sith. But to have those Sith ghosts there influencing everything he does 
kind of negates from his pure darkness avatar thing for me at least yeah i think wrong. so as well i love seeing bane and revan there i do like seeing revan there even though i hate his character i like those connections to legends and look revan's still canon he has the legion of sith troopers named after him in the rise of skywalker visual dictionary so at the end of the end of the day at least since uh december of 2019 we still got the same results but what i'm but what i'm saying is i don't think it would have been good for the story um, yeah and i think the, the idea of him just in like embodying darkness you're probably yeah, right it's, it's a much stronger idea the father kills himself to rid the son of his powers this is another one of the few logistical problems i have with this arc because it seems like this plot point kind of came out of nowhere you know what i mean yeah like, um i mean i you could see it being hinted at a little bit by like the father controlled the son and the daughter but we didn't know that they, he gave them all his power like we didn't know that he gave them power and it, it just kind of convoluted things and they just kind i felt like they just kind of wanted to wrap it up in a in a satisfying way by killing all of them which I which I appreciate. And I understand, and thematically it works. It just seems like logistically it's a little. What are your What are your thoughts overall on this arc? Wait, we 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 forgot to get something. Oh, we did. I mentioned Dilemma X earlier. Let's get to Dilemma X, and it comes from a quote at the very end of the third episode. General Skywalker, come in. We were worried you were off the scopes there for a moment. Mm. For a moment. Looks like Mortis takes place over the course of several days. So that begins Dilemma X. Did it actually happen? This is the thing when I said at the beginning of the episode where it's open to interpretation. I, I they, would say, does it matter? Gave... Like, does it matter? Because obviously time is in this incredibly per perhaps relative and, and very malleable, maybe. So I would contend yeah. that maybe it doesn't matter, perhaps. My, and I, and I think it can be explained away in the universe by saying, like, if you want to go for the route that it did happen, and I personally go for the route that it did happen, that you can just say, well, you know, the Mortis exists out of time, so they escape there out of out of the existence of time. But I think the more the message of that is that you can take away whatever you want from this. Yeah, I've seen an idea floating around Twitter, which I'm not exactly so sure about. I'm not sure if I agree with it. That the prophecy wasn't real. That it was just made up by the Jedi, like that that the Jedi made it up a, while, a long time ago, and it just became so real. Um, and Anakin seemed to fit the bill. Um, and I think this arc, at face value, rejects that idea. But if you look at that final scene, if you can hand wave away Mortis as never happening, you can also hand wave away the Chosen One prophecy. Again, I'm not saying I agree with any of this. I don't. I don't agree with the... the. I, I'm tending not to agree with the idea of the Chosen One prophecy being not unreal. But I'm just saying, if you did think that way, I, there would be your number one direction to go. By the way, the idea of, it, of Mortis never happening to me just means that, like, like I could, I could see a scenario where... It was all in their heads. Maybe. They experienced a vision. Again, I, say, I think Mortis yeah. did happen, but like, you know. I would say more likely it's just that time and space are malleable, and this is clearly an example of something working in a strange and mysterious way. Yeah. But obviously you could see I, I'm Ahsoka and Obi-Wan and Anakin also, like, waving this off as a really strange dream. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because you, you, because one of the other things Anakin says to 
Rex is, you wouldn't believe it. Which seems to suggest to me, at least, that everything in this arc is completely dependent on how you see it. That's just my opinion, though. Um, to me, that just suggested it's very improbable, but that doesn't mean that it it doesn't that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, or even if it didn't happen in the sense that it didn't take up as much time as it felt like it did or it took place not necessarily in the same physical reality that doesn't mean it still doesn't have significance it does have significance oh i think it absolutely does have significance i just think that yeah because even if it was a vision at least in my head it would still have quite a bit of significance uh, but it, it would be it would be the equivalent of the force trying to tell Anakin something about who he is, basically. I want to hear your full thoughts about this arc, because I've been doing a lot of the talking. Um, mm. What are my thoughts on this arc? This is an interesting arc to me. Um, again, I, I'm still not sure. I think I think they're, they're often colloquially referred to as Force gods, but the idea that maybe they're not necessarily personifications of the Force necessarily does help me out a bit with um, thinking about the Mortis arc. Um, with that being said, um, I, I do think that um, it reveals a lot about Anakin. Um, and I think where this arc, where this arc really shines is when it focuses on Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka and the way, w w the way when we see Anakin and Shmi and Anakin looking at his future, the way we really get a lot about him in that. And it's it's a little bit of a look inside the mind of Anakin Skywalker. I wish that this art could also have been a look inside the mind of Ahsoka, a look inside the mind of Obi-Wan. But I think that they chose to go in a more, um, more big picture direction with the father, the son, the daughter. And that didn't really work as well for me, and I didn't really appreciate those parts. Okay, that, that's that's completely fair. Um, I, I think you know what I think about this episode. Um, it, <laughs> yeah. it, I, this arc, it, it's. I'll I'll just I'll just read what I wrote in my notes. Honestly, this arc is a masterful examination of balance of the light side, the dark side, and everything surrounding Star Wars morality. It connects brilliantly with the prequels, originals and sequels yep i said it the last jedi and the rise of skywalker are both beautifully enhanced by this arc and of course the fourth awakens too and it is a real centerpiece to the morals of star wars well done dave well done this is my favorite arc of season three uh it wow you know i am all into the mystical stuff i'm all into the yeah we're just gonna plop um all of the weird force stuff we can into an arc i will say this is to address something else there was a plan in colin trevor's draft at episode nine to have the final battle between ray and kylo ren take place on mortis which i think would have been dumb um so you would not have you would not have I, liked that i might have come around to it it really like again we have a script and concept art from that movie we don't really know what the eventual movie was would have been like I might have come around to it. Who knows? I might have not. But based on how it was portrayed in the script, it seemed forced to me. It seemed like they wanted to do something big and dramatic, like just for having to, uh, the sake of being it so mystical and big and dramatic. And I felt like the end of the Skywalker saga wasn't really a place to go to Mortis. Do you think there's a time and place for everything, but this this was not that? Yes, I, I think it was just the wrong idea. Um, they could have made it absolutely awesome, I'm totally thinking that, but like, you know, let's get to everyone's favorite part of Star Wars in the galaxy. What you've brought me today is worth one quarter portion. One quarter portion day we got, it's a long story, is the... Segment where we explain Star Wars badly to each other and have each other guess it. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. All right. 
So I hope I hope you can get this one. I think you'll be able to. Um, a group of religious of religious fanatics hire a mob to destroy corporate property and manufacturing businesses. Say it again. A group of religious fanatics take advantage of a mob to destroy corporate property and manufacturing businesses. Can you tell me the era? Prequel era. Prequel era. Take advantage of a mob to destroy... Is this the disappeared arc? Because mm, I'm just think, about to get think, to that. Think more, well, think more well known than that. Think, think more yeah, well known. I, I was going to say, because I'm, I'm, I'm like, it sounds a little bit like the disappeared arc because I, I'm just about to get to that and like rewatch like that's the next one. Um, it's not the Citadel. Mm, not the Citadel. I'm quite lost on this one. I'll give you a hint. Know... It's just like the simulations. Is it the, the, the second battle of Geonosis? Uh, very, very close. So I'm going to give it to you and chalk this up not okay. being very good. It is Attack of the Clones, specifically the Battle of Geonosis. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Never mind. Okay. Um, so you it's don't the like first it. Battle of Geonosis. You don't agree with it, but you'll accept it. <laughs> yeah. Um, mine's very vague, too. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I won't blame you if you don't get mine. A criminal mastermind is robbed by a guy, his girlfriend, his best friend, his dog, his best friend's girlfriend, and his father figure. Um, Jabba the Hutt? Um, Return, of the, Jabba Return the of the Jedi? It is, no, it is not uh, that. Um, the Clone Wars movie? You really think the criminal mastermind is Jabba the Hutt? I, I thought the criminal mastermind was Jabba the Hutt. Apparent, I guess, I guess I'm not. wrong. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's not Jabba. Not. It's not Jabba. Okay, good to know. Um, Maybe it was a little stretch to call him a criminal mastermind, but he's the head of a criminal organization. So yes, well, hmm, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't. This is a this is a stumper. Uh, a I'll, criminal I'll mastermind. I'll read it to you again. Yeah, wait. I'll, read it. Yeah, I'll, read it to me again. Read it. And I'll emphasize a part that's very important. A criminal mastermind is robbed by a guy, his girlfriend, his best friend, his best friend's girlfriend, his father figure, and his dog. That's what makes me think it's the original trilogy, but I just I just don't know. It's not the original trilogy. Um... Solo. A Star Wars story. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. okay. Criminal Mastermind is um is Mark Krim of the Pike Syndicate. Yeah. Um, okay, I see that. The now. dog thing was Chewbacca. I was trying mm -hmm. to get you to Chewbacca. No, yeah, I knew it was. I knew it was Chewbacca. Or I was thinking it had to be Chewbacca. Yeah. Um, his girlfriend. I'm talking That's about Kara. Like. Yeah, yeah. Um, his father figure. Yeah, father figure Beckett. is Beckett. Yeah. <laughs> His best friend's girlfriend. I almost said robot girlfriend, but I'm like, oh, that's too obvious. That's going to be it for this episode of Star Wars in a Galaxy, watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. Um, next week, next week, I want to say we have the Citadel. Oh. I think we, I think, I'm going to check, um, but uh, if I don't, if I edit this part out, it's going to be the Citadel. If I don't, it's something else. I'm pretty sure it's the Citadel. Um, I'll just say that. Um, uh, this, uh, I'm, we're looking at the Citadel Counterattack and Citadel Rescue uh, next week. Uh, three episodes that I think Jacob and I both quite enjoy. Um, until until then, follow us on Twitter at In a Galaxy Pod, Instagram at Star Wars in a Galaxy. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Anchor, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts, we'll be there hopefully. If we're not, please contact us. You can contact us at swinagalaxy at gmail.com. Uh, you can also do that. You can also send us your questions, your hot takes, your six degrees of Star Wars. We love hearing from listeners. Um, you can also check us out on YouTube, Star Wars in a Galaxy is the name of our channel where we do occasional live streams and all that stuff. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the first episode of A Theme Between Themes. We're recording this before the first recording of A Theme Between Themes. 
um, but we're releasing it afterwards, so I don't know how that's gonna go. But it's it, it I we have Alden Diaz and Tori Fox from October Radio on. What could possibly go wrong? Um, so yeah. Um, until then, may the force be with you. Sorry, may the manipulative energy field be with you always. <laughs>